Well, yes, welcome everyone to GeoHug. Uh, so before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional land which we're all coming from today. I live on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal of the people of the Aurora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm so excited to have Steve Sullivan joining us today. Steve is a geologist with more than 35 years experience in geological modeling and resource management. Steve's worked for 10 years in exploration, open cut and underground mining before joining MacTech, where he has worked across a diverse range of commodities. So he's currently the technical lead of Domain MCF, a commercial machine learning application for geological modeling. And I'm thrilled that he's joined us today to discuss using diversity to prevent adversity in resource modeling. So it's gonna be a great session. I hope you all enjoy it. Please use the chat and we'll be opening up the floor for discussions at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Steve, for joining. It's wonderful having you. Thanks everyone for, for joining in uh, this afternoon my time, but it might be a different time in your wherever you are. So yes, as just said, um, yeah, I'm Steve Sullivan. Uh, I've been uh, in Matrix for quite some time and during that time I've worked in a whole lot of different areas. Um, here we're showing some of, uh, I guess I, I started exploration, um, went into open cut geology, mine geology, underground mine geology, and then took the big jump in 1995 to jump into um, software and working with software because at the time the company I was working with wasn't uh, very proactive with software and I thought if I didn't uh, start learning software I'd be uh, virtually unemployable at the time so uh, and uh, we've done a lot of things since then and uh, all in mostly involved with resource geology so um, in this afternoon session is going to be uh, some of the reflections I guess I've seen a lot of things happen you know I've gone from uh, in paper sections and interpretations on paper to emulating that on the computer with 2D CAD then 3D CAD and then wireframing and a whole range of other things so uh, I guess I'll cover this afternoon some of the, uh, I guess, some of the opportunities we've got to further improve what we do in, in resource modelling. And during my time, I've worked in a lot of different countries. Um, here we've seen um, China, um, Vietnam, uh, China again, and Laos, uh, as well as throughout Australia and, and other Asian countries. Also do a lot of work with uh, universities. That's one of our tech's um, policies is to, to educate and provide industry assistance to um, undergraduates and, and interns, et cetera. So I've done a lot, a lot of work there, which I've enjoyed and continue to enjoy. So today we're, we're um, just a quick look at what we're gonna talk about. And I guess I'll call it a role, a call is, is why is diversity important in, in geological interpretation? You know, there's lots of different um, discussions about diversity and, and I'm going to focus on, on the uh, in geological interpretation and, um, and how that is, uh, you know, why that is important. Uh, then move on, what does diversity look like uh, in, in this realm, in this subject matter? And then how do we exploit it? Once we've, once we've mastered it, how do we exploit that to our advantage? So well, that's what we'll be covering in the next um, 30 minutes or so. So you know, reasons why would we consider alternative interpretations? Um, you know, we've all been there, we've all made an interpretation, we've all pushed, uh, made a model, we've pushed that model through to production and to engineers and resource reports. Yeah, you know, why would we possibly ever consider alternatives? And I guess one, one reason is to, to really challenge yourself to get a better understanding of, of the deposit. Um, I know when I started with CR Exploration in the, uh, in the mid-80s, uh, mid um, they made a point. We had 200 geologists in our exploration uh, team at the time throughout Australia and Asia, and they made a point of bringing in um, outsiders who had very different views than what us young graduates had and, and some of the more established people had and really challenged our views and made us think uh, think differently. And um, yeah, I guess as a young graduate, I thought, well, this is a bit more out there. But uh, you know, as you mature and reflect, you think, well, and as you see more and more rocks, you feel that, well, was actually there was some benefit in doing that to, to make us think outside, you know, I guess, the box or the square or, or what, whatever we currently thinking in so um in turn alternatives are, are are out there as we'll see later on um once you have an alternative you can then start putting that into the mind planning and get different uh, different outcomes from mind planning and then have a look at um, different scenarios in the planning realm so um you know see which ones are, are more uh, shall we beneficial for the for the company uh, one a very important thing is to comply with the um, the resource reporting rules. Um, you know the code, the current code, JORC 2012 was um, established and written, and that's what we uh, abide by with our reporting. And um, 
if we don't do that, then we're, we're actually missing out on one of the compliance ticks that we have to have, and, and we'll be discussing that shortly. And then to prevent adversity and, and protect our downside risk. So it's really uh, sometimes even before you get to the mine planning side, we want to make sure that um, we don't come up with some interpretation, some model that doesn't reflect reality. And, uh, you know, models are models. And um, you know, as uh, George Box wrote in the statistics in the mid 70s, uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So we want to make sure we are working with those useful ones. So let's have a look. What does adversity look like? Um, adversity looks like from a, from a company point of view, it, it looks like this. Here we have, and I'm not here to, um, to shame in, and, uh, any, any particular company. I'm just saying um, this is a real example, but we'll, we'll keep the identity um, um, to ourselves. Um, but basically, there's a share price here, which reflects the, the company value, shareholder value. Uh, we've got a timeline here, and you know, we're humming along quite nicely. And then we've, we've actually fallen down, the, fallen down a waterfall, I guess, or a cliff or whatever you'd like. And... Um, yeah, that's that's what adversity looks like. Your company value has has now halved. So uh, if you're uh, worth a uh, billion dollars, you're now only worth five hundred million. So that that as a as an owner of a company, it doesn't look particularly good. Now, in the financial terms, you know this is actually uh, has got a label. It's called a black swan event. A black swan event um, originated um, from the concept that you know everyone in the northern hemisphere was used to having white swans, and it wasn't until explorers start hitting Western Australia that they started finding black ones. And you know, a black swan that was not possible. If swans are always white, aren't they? So it's an event that no one forecast, no one predicted, but in this case has an adverse effect on uh, on what happened. And primarily, uh, as a resource geologist, um, you know, we're going to make sure that this doesn't happen on our watch. Now, if it happens on someone else's watch further downstream, that's that's not our responsibility, as long as it doesn't happen on our watch. Now, unfortunately, these black swan events are supposed to happen once every blue moon, but uh, over the last 18 months or so, I've got at least half a dozen examples. Again, I'll keep those confidential, but it's half a dozen where these have happened. So the, the black swans are actually flying more than they should. So how do we prevent that? Well, let's let's delve into this one um, a little bit more deeply. Um, so there was additional drilling since the last report. There was uh, the last report was um, yeah, late uh, around late two thousand and nineteen. So about eighteen months before the, this, the report that we're looking at, uh, or the event that we're looking at, and. Um, that additional drilling caused a change in the orientation of the high grade zones. So um, yeah, that's quite significant. Your high grades where all your value is. And so suddenly they've changed. And if they've changed, therefore your geometry has probably changed. And that made a material difference on the previous e estimate. Material difference both in, in grades uh, and, and contained metal uh, had declined, but the tonnage had increased. And uh, as someone that reviews lots and lots of deposits, probably 50 deposits a year, um, that is quite uh, a common thing. Tonnage has increased, grade has declined. That's because you've got more dilution in there and um, or you've got more included waste. So it's not where you want to be. So going back uh, 18 months earlier from, from the, the report date and the date that they announced and, and the date that the uh, Black Swan event happened, uh, we go back to the, uh, the, the resource report that was uh, sent to the ASX. And there is a section in the Jork 12, 2012, which says that you have to report on the effect, if any, of any alternative interpretations on the mineral resource estimation. And, and on the right is what was written at the time. I see the competent person is confident any interpretation or alternative will result in globally immaterial differences. In other words, it wouldn't make a difference at all. So obviously 18 months later, extra information made a material difference. Uh, they reduced their uh, reserve estimate or resource estimate and the share price on, it, on hearing that uh, announcement uh, halved. So you know, there was obviously a material difference. So there needs to be more work in this, not just put a, 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 a glib response out there. So delving deeper, and, and this is the important thing, it says the, um, as to why this happened, the dominant structural control of the mineralization uh, or structures are potentially far smaller than the drill spacing. So this is under the geological interpretation uh, of that uh, 2019 report. 
So obviously there's a mismatch between the uh, the structures that they're trying to measure and the draw hole spacing that was being used. So that's um, um, probably something that sh they should have said higher up in the uh, alternative interpretation. Yes, there's, there could be an alternative interpretation and in it, 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 it may have, uh, or in this case, it did have a material impact because the geometry is different. And uh, you know, there's various different maths you can do in terms of if you link up th uh, th a few different interpretations and then you change that, you could be down to it at the worst case at about a sixth of the initial vo of the volume of of if you join them up uh, another way. So you know, it makes a big difference. So that's the you know, worst case scenario. I mean, I had to look at page 80 or something of an appendix to find this information. So as a general shareholder, you're not going to find this unless you really dig deep. And, and I guess as an industry, we need to make sure the information we put out there is uh, you know, showing the uncertainty that does exist in these deposits. So on, on finding that and, and investigating further, I looked at the, uh, the top 30 mining companies on the ASX. Uh, and most of these reports I looked at, I looked at over, uh, nearly 70 uh, resource reports, uh, and most in this current reporting period from, from 1st of July to, to one that I only looked at yesterday. And there's a very a lot of different statements about the alternative interpretations. I'm not going to read them all out there, but um, you, know, um, you can see there different people have got different words in there. Um, and, but a lot of them are along, you know, there are no alternative detailed interpretations or, you know, with the current drilling, nothing's, nothing could possibly happen. The one that I really like, and this is, this is a, a direct quote, alternate interpretations of any of the three deposits would be contrived. So they're not only saying that it's not possible, that, that you'd have to really go out of your way to, to make a different interpretation. So, um, you know, that uh, is something that's, uh, you know, I guess I see that there's potential alternate interpretations from nearly every deposit. They might be subtle, but there, there are interpretations that need to be considered. So wrapping this up into uh, a chart uh, of these 70 odd uh, reports that I've just looked at, um, of the top 30 companies on the ASX, 14%, this little sliver here, these ones used in an alternate interpretation and reported on and reported on its impact. So those ones are completely in compliant of, uh, of the regulations. There were seven who acknowledged that there may have been an impact, um, but they haven't actually tried to see what that impact is, but at least they acknowledged it. Uh, and then the rest of them here are either uh, said that there was no possible um, uh, in, no possible alternative, or there was no not expected to be an impact, or in this case, a third of responses didn't even fill in that panel at all. So you know we've got you know just uh, what nearly eighty five percent of companies haven't uh, reported. They may have done it, but they certainly haven't reported their interpretation. So um, I guess you know as an industry, that's um, you know. Um, shall we say this can be improved um we we've got um, obviously in cases not every case but uh, in rare cases where it, it does have an impact so you need to at least look at that so let's have uh, a little break from me talking and i'll just i'll introduce this and time for you to do some interpretation now i've, I've run workshops and this one a couple of you may have seen this uh, before i run workshops uh, where i introduce this just to, to get people uh, in, in the feeling of, of what an alternative interpretation, what interpretation really looks like. So what we have here is a scenario of, of five different drill holes, uh, all vertical in this case. Uh, we, they're drilled from the topography, which I haven't got on there. And um, what we're looking at here is a mineralized material in the red, say, or, or material of interest in the red. And we've got uh, material not of interest in, in the gray. So we've got a binary scenario. So um, you know, if you've got a phone, take a snap, or if you've got a, a sketching thing, you know, or you want to write it down, because I'll, I'll give you some, I'll, I'll have come back to this in, in a couple of slides. But uh, if you want to have a think about that, have a think, you know, how you could interpret that. And the, and the uh, example I give, uh, I ask for in the workshop is, um, you've got, you've been given one drill hole um, to put into this cross-section to find uh, a, a, shall we say, a more certain outcome of the interpretation. Where would you put that drill hole? So before you design a drill hole, you need to think about the geology and where you, where you might place that. So um, have a go at that. And um, I'll continue on with some other content. 
because I will be asking you uh, in a moment uh, what your answer was. So I know we've only got a chat where you can just uh, do ABC. Uh, maybe people can do sign language or whatever, or we can uh, share it later on. But, uh, so building a resource model, and uh, I've done a lot of that, helped a lot of people, mentor a lot of people, and uh, still get challenged by it myself. Um, did a, a survey uh, in, in oh, across a few different workshops asking people how long it takes them to do this resource. And uh, with the number of re responses up here and the time, um, anything from two weeks you know, up to 156 weeks, which is three years, which is, uh, I guess, an extreme outlier. But the general bulk of people in the resource space are working between you know, two and 16 weeks in terms. So that's between two, half a month and four months is about what people are taking to, to build their resource. So um, digging into that even further, uh, we have a look at some some stats. Um, next question was, um, what is the most time consuming part? And, and by far the most consuming part, nearly half of the time is spent on the geological interpretation and modeling process. So, uh, which is good. Um, that That is the, the part that we need to think about. We need to get right. And we need to, uh, you know, get the best possible answer. Uh, equally, uh, not quite equally, but 35% is on sample data, data validation. So that, that is quite a lot, but that's a very important part because that's the input data. If you don't get the input data right, everything beyond that, any interpretation or any model build on that is you know, suspect to whatever uh, data you've included. So that's important. Although you know, I would really like us to improve that as an industry between all the different um, facets to, to reduce the amount of time that a geologist has to spend doing sample data validation. And then the rest of the components in variography estimation and validation is, is only a minor time component. And going into you know, the interpretation phase, building wireframes is something that we've been doing for you know, three decades now. And you know, how important is that? And, and at least half the people uh, couldn't live without them. Uh, most, of the rest, most of the time, 29%. Um, some don't require them at all, and some just use them for visualization. So we've got most people here uh, are still building wireframe models. And then how long does it take you to build these wireframes for, um, for that? And again, you know, majority, 60% over a week. And I didn't actually go beyond it in terms of how many weeks, but you know, the majority of time, mine geologists are spending or resource geologists are spending building wireframes. So um, that's the most intense. So that's just an important thing that you know, I've done in, found in the research. Um, that's what's people taking time. Okay, so you've had a couple of minutes now to, to build your interpretation. I'm going to throw some up on the screen and ask you, ABC, hopefully uh, the chat's still working, uh, Jess, so we can have a look. If people want to uh, have a look at these ones and just answer, did you get A, B, C, or D? If you put something in the, the chat, um, let's see if I can see it. I've got, well, I've got a couple coming through. Thanks, Nick. Good to, been a while since we've chatted. Good to see. And John Taylor. It's good we've got a couple there that um, have done interpretation, whether that's uh, in, their, in their mind or, or otherwise. Yeah, we've got some bees. It's almost got a, a very bad pun. It's almost like a hive here. We've got B, 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 B. Uh, a, lovely. I have to chart these as histogram as well. And they're still coming in. It's good to see people interpreting things really quickly. I like that. And obviously, we're talking a simple 2D example. Um, once you start getting the 3D, actually, once you're starting to get the 3D, it can be more complex, but it can also be simpler because you've got more constraints that you can you need to work with. I reckon a quick run through there without counting them, I reckon overwhelmingly we've got B, uh, really, which is good. Yeah, that's a good observation. And you know what? Even if you didn't participate, um, all the answers are correct. In fact, um, I should have should have had another one. I should have said all of the above because um, I've done this uh, oh, 150 different responses. And here's a sample of the 20 different diverse geological interpretations I've got from those five simple holes. So I'll leave that up there for a little while. Um, so you start off from the top top here. We've got someone. We've got a sheeted vein system dipping over to the uh, well, my right. Might be your right left, but my right. And then as you progress here, you've got slightly different variations of veins dipping that way. 
then you start merging in, in there, start flattening off, and uh, eventually uh, you start dipping back the other way. It's coming back through here. And then you get the people that uh, you know, have interpreted uh, folds and uh, stacked lenses and, and more stacked lenses. And then you get the really funky people who've, uh, well, not funky, but the interpretations, which are now showing you know, uh, tigmatic and isoclinal folds and then uh, faults and you know, getting very creative. So it's a very simple example, but it, it does show that you know, from that, that um, simple five holes, there's at least 20 different uh, plausible answers. And when I say plausible, all these to me could happen geologically. Now, none of them are, are, are outright silly that wouldn't happen. Now, you know, some people here, you know, if you've worked in um, high-grade metamorphics uh, or myelinite zones, you might be familiar with this. If you've worked in sheeted vein systems, you're up here. If you've worked in uh, you know, folded uh, terrains here and here, so um, and then, then all sorts of other horsetail and other vein systems. So any of these are geologically possible. So you know, we have here a real diversity of, of different um, in terms. But now we've got that diversity, what do we do with them? I mean, it's very simple. We, we're able to generate each of those you know, in, in maybe one or two minutes. That's okay. But if we've got a deposit that's taking us four months to build a, a resource model, uh, we haven't got four months to do another or an alternate one or, or 20 alternate ones. And it's just not possible. So, you know, how can, not, or not in the current way we're doing things. So how can we, how can we do that? So what I'll do is I'm going to jump to a case history because um, you know I didn't name and shame uh, previously uh, with the black swan, but I want um, so I'm going to look at a case history here of uh, a deposit um, that I modelled. So I'm quite happy to criticise or, or have a look at and evaluate myself. I modelled uh, for a customer, and I've got full permission to show this deposit here. It's the Muduru Copper Gold. Um, Copper Cobalt Gold Project uh, in South Australia. So uh, location here, South Australia, uh, Broken Hill is just across the border. Everyone in the Australian industry should know Broken Hill. And we're just across from the South Australian side of, of the Kernamona province. And here we have the background, it's uh, just a nice piece of South Australia. I think about 90% of South Australia looks like that. And a quick run through the geology here. Uh, we've got high-grade metamorphics. So we've got quartzofilspatic, nice granite, nice uh, amphibolites, uh, some schists, some pelites, and things. Uh, so quite highly uh, high, high strain, high, quite ductile deformation. And we've got uh, mineralization here, generic cross section, um, massive sulfides, semi-massive sulfides in uh, a contact uh, between the uh, amphibolite and the uh, one of the uh, nices, and then also within the um, the amphibolite itself. So here we are here, the amphibolite, unfortunately, uh, the amphibolite, cha amphibolite changes colours a couple of slides later, but amphibolite here, and then we've got these uh, a whole lot of lenses coming through uh, through there in the plan view. Again, another another section, just uh, summarising a quick cross section, but you know, there's over 250, maybe 280 holes have been drilled into this deposit now over about uh, two or three kilometres of strike length. Um, it's still in the um, a, a project stage. It's not a not an active mine. Um, and you can see here that uh, quite close space fences of information coming through. What it looks like here is a, a, some diamond core and showing the, the, the good gear, the copper, copper um, chalk of pyrite, copper sulfide, massive here, or semi-massive, and then uh, a pyrite, which is the more, um, I guess, brassy color here, and, and some pyrotide as well. So you've got iron sulfides and copper sulfides and the copper and the cobalt and the gold sit, sit together. And you know, in uh, 2010, so we talked 12 years ago, I worked um, on the project uh, with Dr. Chris Giles, the technical director, and we came up with a, a resource estimate that was done using wireframing and, and block models and um, came up with, with a result, which was reported to the ASX at the time under the JORP 2004. Come around to June 2020, we did, uh, did an update. There was some incremental drilling and um, then the, the resource statement that you've got there. So there was enough, what's that, about 13 million tonnes at 1.5% copper, a bit of gold and a bit of cobalt. So that was all good. That was all done traditionally uh, and um, reported and, and there's no problems with that. 
So what I did then, just recently, um, earlier this year, was to say, okay, that was done. That, that took, uh, how, I can't remember exactly, but it was a couple of weeks' work to do the resource report there, and the resource model of the report. Um, how about we have a look at um, what we can do with the next generation of technology? So we, um, I call it data-driven geology. Uh, it could also be you know, called other things, but you know, basically we, we're taking data. Um, this could be uh, conventional data, uh, it could be some automated sensors. Hopefully in a future state, we get more and more of these automated sensors into a, a, a database that's merged together, validated, uh, then put through some type of uh, you know, compute engines, uh, and various ones uh, to come out with the, uh, the output, which is uh, you know, all your resource report. Often there's feedback loops because you do, do it once and you, you, you find some things that uh, aren't quite right. So you come back and you iterate and back through that until ultimately you've got the final answer. So there's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, and what I've been working with over the last uh, three or four years so with, uh, is machine learning. So I've grabbed uh, the SkyKit Learn algorithm cheat sheet because you know, that just shows you some of the approaches you can do. So we're talking about geological data, drill data, sample data, mapping data, and we want to get out of that some type of three-dimensional uh, model with, with attributes. So how do we go about it through uh, machine learning? Now, this is not going to be a big talk about the, the, the process of machine learning, just to show you that there's a lot of different things to, uh, to, to, to consider. So I guess you've got three different approaches, or at least three different approaches. You can upskill yourself and uh, get, um, get some education, go some courses, uh, and, and learn how to do it yourself and build and use a whole lot of open source kits and, and things and, and uh, build up your own te technique and, and works that way. You can uh, go to consultants that already have that inbuilt capability and, and pay them, and they can then provide those services to do that. Or you can go to a commercial uh, service, um, such as the one that uh, I've used here is Maptex Domain MCF, which you just upload your data and uh, it runs the process and you get the result and it just uh, charges for your time. So you have three different approaches and that depends where you are in the, the maturity of learning about machine learning. On this slide, there's a couple of very key inputs, especially when you come to three-dimensional uh, resource modeling and geology. One is, here we have a, a start. We go down here and it says, you know, less, greater than 50 samples, then progress ahead. And if you don't have that, it says get more data. That's a very important thing. Now, this example here, 50 samples you know, geolo geolo geologically, that's, that's not going to get you a, a very good model. I mean, if you've got you know, 50,000 samples or uh, a million samples or the biggest one I've run had 100 million samples, then, then, you, then you're really talking, you're going to get some benefits. If you've only got you know, a small amount of data, a small number of holes, you know, this three-dimensional modeling is, is not suitable for you. So it's um, useful to understand that it, it likes lots of data. So um, if you don't feed it, it, it's not going to give you the results that are anywhere near um, possible. And same over here, you know, once you get down to this technique here, it's got, you know, less than 10,000 samples. And it says basically tough luck. You know, you've got no chance. So yeah, machine learning does need uh, large um, amounts of data. And I've given talks um, and there's probably some that you can hear, which I've talked about the data sizes, et cetera. So how do we go? So we feed in this data. So we've got real data from the 280 holes. We've done, done some um, sampling down the holes. Uh, we've taken into account copper and cobalt and gold, as well as the, uh, the rock types. And we ended up here, this is just an, an oblique view with a, a plan view here, which is kind of showing you uh, what we saw previously. And then cross-section views cut through that every 200 meters. Unfortunately, the slides have changed. So this amphibolite is green, whereas the previous slide, it was blue, but that's the amphibolite. That's the basic host unit. You can start to see the, uh, the, the, um, the massive um, quartz field spathic, nice undifferentiated out here. And you've got some thinner zones here, which are the, uh, the light blue, which is some of the, the, uh, the schistose bands through here. And I've put the old wireframes, that's in the 2020 wireframes, against the machine learning model. So there's your drill holes through here. And this is all these sections are, are the machine learning model. So that's come from um, just your sample data uh, and through the machine learning process, it's come out with that result for you in the form of a, a three-dimensional block model. 
If we take a, a more of a bench slice here and look at it, what we have in the, the background here is the slice um, through the machine learning model. And we also have the drill pierce points. This is about, I oh, know they're about two meters high, I guess, through um, through this particular level. And you can see here how the um, the, the pierce points of the uh, the geology uh, match the uh, the output from the uh, from the drill holes match the output from the, the block model slice, showing that uh, we're getting representation uh, correct in in all these examples from from that. So in the areas here, we don't have any data at all, no input data. So that's interpolation through the machine learning process to interpolate what's between those two. So that's pretty easy. Grid goes to green, goes to green gets a bit harder when you've got green here and, and you know a pink color there or, or green and blue close together or blue and green so you know that's all part of the process but what uh, what does impress me on this one is that the computer doesn't know that this is a high grade metamorphic terrain it doesn't know that you can get um, you know boudin, boudinaged um, and uh, you know, very ductile shapes but the outcome from this model uh, appears you know, shall we say quite geological uh, it doesn't look out of the question. I mean, locally, you might find some variation, but overall, it looks like it, uh, you know, it fits into the style of deposit that we're trying to model, which is an important tick. Not all of the resource models I see, or the wireframes I see, really reflect the, um, the style of deposit that's being modeled. Now, if we get right down to tin tax now, uh, on the next um, section, We've got in, in the pink, these are the wireframes that were built in 2010 and upgraded in 2020. And then underlying that is the model from the machine learning in the, in the orangey color, I guess, showing uh, where the machine will interpolate and join those uh, individual samples together. So you can see here, this is work that uh, you know, I've done and already I'm seeing that the model is different. You know, I've got diversity. I've got a, a different model than one I had in my head and the field geologists and the team that worked on this um, had. And uh, now which one's right or wrong? That's not really a, something that I can tell without more drilling, but at least it's giving me some thoughts. You know, so for example, here, I've got uh, previously, the interpretation was this mineralization that jumped across. Whereas the machine learning model is actually saying, no, it actually projects through, and this one may even join up to that one there that you predicted, which is an extension of that one, which is an extension of that one. So, you know, it, it starts to raise some questions, starts to open a conversation and say, well, if we need to, if we, if we want to clarify which one's right, well, we, you know, we need to put a drill hole here because, hey, look, we've got an interpretation there from the machine, and we've got our previous one there. You know, are either of those right, or have we got a third interpretation? So um, it really um, opens up the question. And you know, I was quite surprised. I only put this together earlier this week to say that, oh, that's quite different. But it's not wrong. And one might be better. In fact, I like this machine learning model, especially the fact that this is the contact um, here, how it's run the mineralization all the way along the contact, whereas previously it kind of stopped it. And so it's actually you know, showing, showing some quite um, geologically um, valid results. So if we have a look at that in cross section now, and let's have a look in cross section. So uh, here we are, we're about halfway through the deposit here. And these are the drill holes again, just colored um, with uh, mineralization, just like the, uh, the section, the interpretation we did. We had yeah, all, uh, waste material, all material, waste material, keep it very simple. And this model here uh, was built, this orange model, all of these built in the one pass in uh, with the machine learning, uh, with this commercial machine learning model. Okay. Now, if I had to wireframe that, it's going to take me some time. And it can, and it, well, the previously it did, it took now up to a week or more to do that, just that part of the thing. Um, and so, you know, over the last uh, two and a half years, I don't think I've built a wireframe. Now, I've done all my geological resource modeling um, without wireframes, using machine learning to build the ge geometry. Um, because why frames when you start getting into areas like this where it's uh, horse tailing, getting very thin and thick, uh, is um, uh, quite a time consuming um, method. It doesn't matter whether you do it manually, implicitly or explicitly, there's different schools of thought. It's still either way is, is a time consuming process. 
So how long did this take? Well, I guess we'll have a look here and we've, we've got another section. This time we're looking at the grade trends. So at the same time as you're doing the, the geology, you're doing the grade trends. You're looking at the distribution in this case of copper, the high grade being in pink and the uh, then grading down from red, orange to green to, to light blue. So you're seeing the distribution of the um, of the uh, of the material, the, the, in this case, the, uh, the, the massive um, pyrotite um, chalcopyrite mineralization. So how long did that take you know, for, for doing all this? Well, it only took, here we are, and this is a, a direct screenshot done uh, ooh, yesterday. Uh, this whole process from taking the data, uh, the input data and getting the model out only took just over an hour. So here we are, we've got an alternate geological model in just over an hour. So no excuse for anyone not having an alternate model if you can do that. And I guess probably built 150 different deposits over the last two or three years. And the most I've taken, I think, is four hours for a deposit. And that was a deposit that was you know, five Ks by six Ks by two Ks, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of blocks. So, um, you know, there's uh, most deposits in the world can be done in around an hour or, or half an hour. So where does that take us? Well, what that allows us to do is not just uh, not just do one model, but we can do a second model and a third model and a fourth model, each taking, in this case, an hour and 11 minutes uh, or thereabouts each. So we can end up with a suite of models. And machine learning, as you saw in that um, the SkyKit Learn, there's a lot of different techniques. You can subtly tweak some of the parameters and get a, a different result. And by getting a different result, we can then take each of those uh, into our um, pit optimization process and to come up with a, an ultimate pit. Uh, then we can break that down into a, a, a stage model to take into the you know, first stage, second stage, third stage of, of mine planning. We can then take each of the models, each of the alternate geology models, and we can then put them through an economic process uh, and, and a financial evaluation. And take those financial valuations from each of those and compare them. And here's what we've done. And this is working in conjunction with the University of Adelaide and uh, some of our researchers here. And um, I've taken here 10 different uh, models of the same project, each with a different color, starting at period zero where there's no, no value, or there's actually a pre-strip, that's why it doesn't start at zero, pre-strip, and evaluated, uh, um, looking at the um, schedule optimization of each of those block models, and looked at what the, the block model is worth at the end of every period. And you can see uh, it, it changes a lot. Ultimately, at the end, you've exploited the whole deposit and it's the same value. But um, you know, if you wanted an early start, you might want to pick this one here in terms of getting early uh, cash, because you can get you know, here, what's that? Almost double the, the, the value of the project at period six by choosing this option. Now, by taking the money early, obviously you get a hit later on in period 10 because um, you, you've already pinched all the, all, all the good material. But you know, it, it allows you to the engineer then to do sensitivity analysis and really exploit that capability of the alternate models to, find, um, to, to determine you know, what's best for the whole, whole operation. So we, we're going to the world where we're not just doing one model and, and having a fixed outcome. We've actually got a suite or an ensemble of models and taking them through. And then we can pick which one is best for the, the whole life of mine or the short-term plan or whatever goal that um, the engineers are working towards. So there we are. We've gone from why we do alternate models. Now we're showing how to exploit them and how to get the best value out of them. So you know, wrapping up, yeah. You know, Alternate geological interpretations, they do exist. And I'd probably argue that even for the most simple geometries, they still, they will exist. Uh, you might have a very tabular ore body uh, or coal seam or, or stratigraphic deposit. And it may not be the geometry of the, um, the deposit that is, uh, is the thing that needs to be interpreted differently. It might be the deleterious elements. It might be the sulfur in the coal, or it might be the uranium in the copper, or some of those minor elements. Um, it might be... Um, uh, the uh, the phosphorus in your iron ore. They are the ones that need an alternate interpretation um, because the overall um, mineralization, the geology is actually okay, but it's the distribution of different elements within that um, which are critical. So I'd argue that nearly everywhere there's alternate interpretations. 
as I've just demonstrated and from my experience, and unfortunately, um, most of the deposits I work on are confidential and I can't share them, but you can generate nearly every deposit in the world uh, in, using machine learning uh, within a few hours and you get an alternative. And I can tell you, they won't be identical to what you've already got. Um, there's some, some brilliant structural interpretations that have come out of some great trend modeling um, out of, the, out of uh, some of our customers. Um, because uh, yeah, it's it's seeing things differently than we can traditionally do. And it, it provides the job is time to sit, analyze and think about things rather than spend all your time digitizing and wireframing it and, and doing say non, really a lot of that's non-geological. That adds diversity into the thinking. Um, you can, uh, as I saw with my example with the Mutaroo deposit, you, what I did Two years ago and ten years or twelve years ago is very has has there's some differences there and, and starts thinking about what could be um, what may may exist. We've already seen that then provides you input to the the mine planning side and uh, projects. And finally, protects us against adversity. So if we go back to our first uh, example there, uh, if you'd run a, uh, a model there, a machine learning model on that, that project, I'm sure you would have come up with something different to what um, the, um, the original model was. And uh, that can then be evaluated. So I guess the, the question for everyone uh, now is, um, how will you build your alternate model? So uh, again, there's, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but how will you how will you change how will you take that on board to get that to to get that alternative model that you require for resource reporting? And uh, I guess uh, one example that I'd, it seems to be happening a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of places is that um, they're very similar to friends of mine on the weekend. They went for a simple drive, 80 mils of rain the week before, drove off the uh, the track, they got bogged. And a lot of us are bogged down in doing what we currently do, doing the same thing day after day to even you know, look out the window and see what's out there, what else could be done. And uh, yeah, let's get ourselves unbogged and uh, let's uh, yeah, open our minds to, to alternative, um, alternative uh, interpretations because I know they're out there and it's just a matter of seeking them. So uh, just a couple of quick acknowledgements, uh, Dr. Chris Giles, Technical Director for Havala for uh, permission to present, and also Will Reed from MapTech and his co-authors on uh, that, if, that uh, mining and the uncertainty for the online planning. So that's me, Steve Sullivan. Thank you for listening, watching, and happy to open up to questions.